2008, I quit my job to create a company um, that was designed to create software to solve different kinds of problems. And at some point, I had to do some work on mobile platforms. Um, if I remember correctly, I was working in, in a company called Tiscan. And uh, this guy sold me a phone for HTC, but it was in French. So I decided, OK, uh, French is not a language that I speak, so let me go see if I can change it into English. Uh, being Mr. Engineer and everything, I went online, I found the English version of the operating system. I said, well, this should be easy, I'll download it, and I killed my phone in the process. Um, it cost me 200,000 shillings, so I cried a little bit, and then um, I decided, well, I'm going to have to pay back. So I called my sister up in the States and I said, look, can you send me a phone for $500? It's a HTC phone, it runs Windows Mobile, and you'll send it over to me and I'll see what I can do with it. And she did send the phone. And I sat down and created an application, and the basic application was um, SMS social network. You know, Facebook, everybody's heard it, everybody's on it, except me, myself, and I. And um, I decided if those guys can do a kind of Facebook, let me do a small version of it by myself over here. And so I sat down for about two weeks, I wrote some code, and the idea was that here you are in Dar es Salaam, and you want to meet some people, and if you're lazy like me, you want to do it without leaving the house. So you would take your phone, you would write your name, your age, your agenda, and so on. You would post it up into this database, and other people like yourself would be able to see those profiles and they'll be able to join and use the service. It used to run on the Tigo network. It took about two weeks to work. I introduced it to about five students at IFM, and it was the time of the closing school, so these people went to Arusha and Morogoro and Dodoma, and maybe about a year and a half later, it was 10,000 members using it on a daily basis. That was quite an interesting success. Um, it taught me quite a bit about how to create mobile applications and how mobile applications can work in a very wide variety of areas and how people can use it to develop themselves and make businesses and so on. But the main focus for today's conversation, I think, is to understand um, some of the themes. Uh, I'll be looking back here, it was a slide, but apparently there isn't, so I'll stop looking back. Um, the, the main idea is to understand what is this development business? Because it's, it's a boring topic, but it's an interesting topic in the sense that if we do solve it, it addresses issues of real people. People who are living outside the cities do need the kind of services and facilities that we have right here in Dar es Salaam. So as a problem that is worth solving, um, we need to understand what it is and what techniques we can take and drop move from there. So question number one, you hear development. Everybody probably knows the meaning of that word, but what does it really mean to be developed? Um, we've always heard of developing countries or uh, developed nations and so on. And in this particular context, we're talking about developed areas and areas that are not developed. So, um, would anybody care to say maybe what the definition of development is? By the way, I forgot to say that uh, I, I'm here because I won Apps for Africa. This is a competition that allows people who got IT skills to solve problems related to climate change. Uh, the first prize was $15,000. I won Yay. that. So if you <laughs> Answer some of the questions I'm asking. You just might get a little bit of yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> so development. Anybody uh, have an idea what that would mean? What does it mean to be developed or undeveloped? What does it mean to be urban and unurban? What does it mean to be in the city and not in the city? Anybody? Fifteen thousand dollars. Okay. Nobody's taken. I keep the money for myself. Um, if we say development is about say the facilities and the life that you can enjoy. We say the city is developed because you've got roads, you've got electricity, you've got air conditioning, you've got phone calls, you've got internet access, you've got all of those things. And we say not developed is the opposite of that. If you've got a road, it's probably a dirt road. If you've got a phone, it's probably a boring cement one with a screen that's orange. If you've got an internet connection, it's probably slow and unfunctional or too expensive and so on. So when we're thinking about development, we need to understand that the idea is to take people who don't have the kind of facilities that we enjoy over here and somehow create a way for them to enjoy those things. Okay? And uh, the topic of my uh, discussion, that was quite fancy, I think if you saw it from there, it was the idea of crowdsourced knowledge exchange over mobile. Now, when, whenever you're doing a presentation like this, it's always important to have those cool words and one of them is crowdsourced. Now that word, anybody heard it? Crowdsourced. Yes. Uh, basically, it's just sourcing from the crowd, uh, taking stuff that would normally be contributed by a select few and just opening it up so that anybody, people like yourself, could contribute that information. And um, 
As a, I'm going to have three steps to this talk. Uh, the first one will look at what is development, and then number two will develop a theory as to how people or areas become developed, and then number three will develop an application that can help us apply that theory. So we've already defined development as the set of things that you can access. Now we have to understand what is it that causes Dar es Salaam to be this way and places outside Dar es Salaam to be the way they are. Once we've discovered that, once we know what it is that causes development, then we'll be in a position to apply and create applications that can generate the specific result. Okay? So my theory, again, this is exploratory, we're thinking about it, it's brainstorming. The idea that the thing that causes two places or two people or two countries to be developed and not developed is the amount of information that they have access to. Think about it this way. Suppose you're going outside Dar es Salaam and then there's an area of land where there's nobody there. Okay? Um, there's two types of people. There's a person who has information and there's a person who does not have information. The person who has information is able to develop that area because they can ask key questions about it. Who lives here? What is under the ground? Is there something of value that they can bring over here? If I was to bring a product over here, how much money would it make? You know, things like population density and distribution and incomes and all of that stuff. Before any huge organization wants to invest in countries over here, this is a big problem for them because, say, for example, Nivea wants to bring in a new product. Um, they want to bring it to Tanzania, and they need to know stuff about Tanzania before they can do that. It's information that they need to access. So my basic theory is that if you've got two places or two people who are developed and not developed, the reason for the gap between them is the amount of information that they have access to. If I don't have the information that I need to make a certain decision, then I'm not going to invest, I'm not going to uh, take risks, I'm not going to venture into an area and do things that would create the natural development. Are we in basic agreement with that theory? Do you think it sounds quite good? It would be workable? No, we are not in agreement. Okay, you're not in agreement. Perfect. You will not get $15,000. No. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, okay. Well, whatever you do today, you may depend on your ability, your skills, your knowledge. If you give that for permanent, all that same information that I would give you, mm -hmm. you want to know what to do with that information. Okay, now that's true. Yeah, it depends on the kind of information. If I'm teaching you how to build a supercomputer in your farmer, that's not going to help you. But if I'm going to give information about crop yields and the soil that is in your area, that will help you. So the type of information that you have obviously affects what you can and cannot do. But basically, for two people who are equal in every respect, the one who doesn't have information is going to have less development than the person who does. Disagreement again? I agree. Oh, thank you very much. Now I'm winning. Okay, so um, if the theory is that the amount of information you have access to affects the level of development that you have, then the next step is to find a way of reducing not so much the income gap, but the information gap. So if I am outside Dar es Salaam and I don't have this information, what can we do as developers? Developers in the room, how many? People who write applications, who write code? Quite a number of you. What can we do to decrease that gap? What can we do so that a person in the city of Dar es Salaam and a person who is outside Dar es Salaam can have the right amount of information to make the decisions that they take? The basic theory goes like this. I go into a place, I want to do something creative, I want to open a business, I want to uh, open a school, I want to create a hospital. I've never been there, so I need to have information. Who lives there? What do they have? What do they need? That kind of thing. If I don't get that information, I don't take that risk. If I don't take that risk, that area, that school, that hospital, that uh, building is not created. And if that area, is, if that is not created, then the area does not develop. Okay? Now, in terms of applications, and the thing that I'm talking about is if we can create a platform that um, leverages the mobile networks that we have and create out of it a general service. Anybody know Wikipedia? Plenty of people know Wikipedia. It's a fantastic resource. And if you think about Wikipedia, it's entirely insane. The basic idea is this. Anybody can go online and just put an article and talk about whatever it is that they want. Plus, if you go, for example, onto Wikipedia right now and the article about George Bush and you don't like who he is, you can say he's a loser. You can actually write that, and for a few seconds, the entire world will be able to see that until somebody changes it. Okay? This is that idea of crowdsourcing. It's the largest encyclopedia on the web, and it's entirely free because people are not, there's not a select group beforehand. Anybody know about Inkart Encyclopedia and those old things that have all died along? Yeah. The, the, they used to be there, there used to be a bunch of experts who would sit down and would say, we know what we're talking about. We know the science and the economics and the politics, and we write it, and then they would sell it. It would be a fat book like that. But now with Wikipedia, you could be a specialist on sand. 
Well, that would be very boring, but on Wikipedia you can go up, you can write an article, and other people who are interested in the same topic can contribute. This is what I was talking about, crowdsourcing. It's a very cheap way to get information that is valuable, and also information that is quite of high quality, because just like the crowd can contribute that information, the crowd can also contribute to editing it. So if you went into John Bush's page and you said this thing that was not very proper, somebody else would see it and they would alter it, and that would help us move on. So that's the crowdsourcing aspect of it. I am saying that if we can use the channels of SMS, if we can use the channels of USSD, if we can use the channels of the web to create a platform that allows people to ask and answer questions and contribute information in the same way we have Wikipedia, then we're going to reduce the gap that causes uh, you know, one area to be developed and another one not to be developed. The idea is as follows. I am sitting over here in Dark Slam. I have a bit of money. So uh, there's somebody who is in Singida, for example. Um, they probably have a bit of money themselves as well. As a person who is sitting over here, I've got no clue whatsoever going on, uh, going on, uh, no clue about what's going on in Singida. In fact, I've never been there. But I hear there's something called mafuta uh, anxiety. This is like uh, sunflower oil cooking oil. There's a whole bunch of people who use it. I don't. Um, but there's a whole bunch of people who use it here in the city, and it is something that can generate revenue for a lot of people. Now, with the money that I've got in my pocket right now. I have no basis for information on how I can invest in that business. I've never been to Singida, I've never been to Tanga, I do not know a single person over there. But imagine if this platform was online. I would take my phone and I would uh, open the USSD menu. USSD is quite nice because this menu driven is quite easy for people to use, like MPS, I can use it, and TigoPest, and so on. I would look through the list of uh, locations, I would say Singida, and then I would say ask a question. And I would basically say, is there anybody out there who is interested in supplying sunflower oil for me here in Dar es Salaam? And it would just go out into the air. Now, people in Singida themselves, who will also be using this platform and this service, can register themselves as experts. So somebody will use the USD menu and say, I'm an expert at this particular type of business, say, okay, so I'm an expert in this particular type of business and I am interested in helping you. So once the question has been asked by myself, it should be put on this platform and anybody out there who is familiar with that particular topic can look at it and say, well, I know a place where this sunflower is grown. I have a couple of people who I'm supplying. Can I do business with you? I uh, would we'll exchange phone numbers, we we'll exchange email addresses if he has email, and we'll be able to communicate. And using that kind of information, I'll be able to take funds that we have here in the city and channel them over to the place in Singida where this person has the stuff, and they will ship it back over here. Another crazy example is dried fish. I mean, these are the type of things that you see in the market, but you never really know where it comes from. Um, I met a person recently who said for 100,000 shillings she could get 23 kilos of dried fish. I never knew that, and probably never knew that, and probably will never know that unless I've spoken about it today. Now, with that kind of information in my head, I can take 100,000 shillings, I can give it to her. She also said that once she brings the fish over here, she is able to sell them for about two or 3,000 shillings extra on top of the money that she makes. So it's a quite decent profit, about 38%. And because of the information that we were able to exchange, in fact, we were talking over the mobile phone before we even met. She heard my name from somebody and um, that person gave her my number and we talked about it and when we met today, it was a three second meeting. I said, here's 100,000, please go get your fish. When you come back, please pay me back some interest. Let's make some money. Now, that kind of uh, exchange and that kind of interaction, again, is facilitated by the mobile networks. It's facilitated by a platform that right now is in form. I have to know you, you have to know that person, and then you connect the two of us and we move together. But if we could formalize that, if we could turn it into an application that is um, standardized and available across the mobile networks, I believe this kind of information exchange is the key that is going to allow people to develop further. I think my three minutes are up, so thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.